morning, everybody. I hope everybody had a good week. I am going to, uh, this morning, we're going to do something that we've done before, um, probably about almost two years ago, a year and several months ago. And uh, I don't want you to think I'm lazy. I'm just super busy. And uh, every day since you saw me last, last Sunday, I've been at work. So um, this was a fun thing to do, I thought, for me. Uh, and I hope you'll probably remember once we start. Um, this morning, mostly, you, if you want to take notes, that will probably be most of what it is. Um, it's just note taking and preparation for the next few weeks um, as we go into this. I'm probably not going to redo every single lesson from the series. Uh, for one, I can't find one of them, and we'll see uh, where we go from there. Um, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful uh, to be here with you today. Um, thankful to be with each other uh, and to, to learn what we can about who you are, um, about the Bible, uh, and things that we've, we've learned from it uh, and from you. And hopefully, Lord, we can take some of these things and think on them uh, and see where they lead us, uh, each as individuals, uh, in a path in a direction towards who you are and who you want us to be. Amen. So what we're going to talk about this morning is seven ways to read your Bible. Uh, and as I said, we've done this one before, and hopefully you'll remember some of it. But as I was looking at it, I have to admit there were things in here that I don't know if I've done since I first read the book I got this from, or actually gave this lesson. As I read it, I'm like, oh, I haven't thought about some of these things. So it's kind of good to renew yourself anyways and, and review some things. Uh, but what this comes from is a book, and I shared it with you before. Um, I don't know if anybody went out and got it and read it, but it's excellent. It's called A More Christ-Like Word. It's by Brad Jerzak. Um, it's the last in a series of uh, More Christ-Likes, if you want to call them that. It's a more Christ-like way a more Christ-like God, and a more Christ-like Word. Um, personally, I, th I thought uh, the last two of the series were uh, the most meaningful to me, um, but the first one also is really, really good. Uh, in fact, the first one I read years ago, and I don't know if you remember, we did something with chairs once. Um, that was from, from his book, which was really cool. Uh, so... I think when I first uh, started reading a lot of other material by people um, that I had found, uh, this, this guy was probably among the couple that really started pointing my direction uh, on what I see uh, the Bible to be and how I approach the Bible and how I read uh, the Bible and, and things that I find in it. Um, it doesn't mean that every single time I pick up the Bible and read it, that I have all these things in my mind. But if something draws my attention or interest, or I read something somewhere and I go decide to look it up, then sometimes some of these principles I try to, to keep in mind um, in how I might interpret it, what I'm reading. Uh, and so it's good. And uh, I said before that up until the time I read these books, I had always misused the Bible. And I think that's very common among Christianity. Uh, but what I realize now today is that I probably still misuse the Bible because it's a learning process, right? I don't think it was anything that God ever intended it just to lay out and say, there it is. He wants us to search, to find, uh, and to look. So it's interesting. And one of the things that I find more and more interesting as I go on is that it doesn't matter about the theological backgrounds or the denominations or any of that. There's people from all these different walks of life and beliefs that have really, really insightful and neat things to show us, um, which is kind of neat also. So some people might say, but where's your focus? Where's your direction? Well, the focus and the direction is on Christ and the cross. They all have things that can help us get into that direction. 
you know, you just have to leave the other stuff to the side. If it's theological stuff you don't believe um, or you don't agree with, you can either look into it more or see how it can apply, or you say, uh, I'm not going to worry about that, and you just keep reading um, because they have a lot of good things uh, to, to offer. Um, I think of Richard Rohr, who's, you know, uh, a Catholic, and I read him all the time. I get his email. He has an email thing that he sends out. Uh, and I just, it's interesting. Most of the things he doesn't really ever talk about the Catholic doctrines or whatever. He might bring some stuff out once in a while. He might even say stuff against it and say, well, this is what we've always done in the Catholic Church, but, you know, I don't see it that way now or I don't do it that way now. So, you know, it's, it's interesting to read different people's journeys because that's what it is. It's a journey. Our relationship with God is a journey, and that's what the Bible teaches us. Um, you know, I... If you, I may mention before of watching a TV series, and I just think about the past couple of days, Lisa and I love UK, United Kingdom, Scotland, Ireland, British, whatever, even European crime dramas. A lot of them have subtitles, which is great. I don't care. Uh, they're so intricate. We're so used to watching a crime drama in the United States and every single episode is a new crime. Once in a while, they expand it out over a couple shows, but it's all new. Over there, they have one crime for the whole season, which is really neat because it gets so developed and you get to see so much more about all the characters. Uh, and it's really cool. And some of them we've even watched a couple times and we're like, oh, I don't remember that because there's it's so intricate. Um, that's just like the Bible. It's intricate. It has a lot going on in it. And that's why every time you go back, you find more. And I think primarily, while most people use the Bible and they see it as a rule book for life, it's about relationships, about the relationship between God and creation uh, and how that relationship works uh, from the beginning all the way to the end. It's about God trying to display who he is to men. Uh, and of course, God didn't just come down and plunk himself in the middle of a large group right away and say, okay, this is who I am, this is why I created you, and this is what we're going to do. He gave people the option to go out and learn about life on their own as free individuals. Um, as free as they possibly be, of course, depending on things going on around them. But all of them have different backgrounds, different thoughts. They were different types of people, um, different personalities, different cultures, which is very important. And so they all developed different beliefs about who they thought God was. Um, and that's what we find in the Bible. It's a long journey. And it is going to, as you do it, it's going to going to cause you to think, it's going to tax your emotions, tax your intellect, and it's going to make you work uh, to find out who God is. And that is going to change probably throughout the time. I mean, God to me is way different than God was when I was young. I think back, you know, when I first got saved, the reason was because I was in school, Sunday school, and they talked about hell. Of course, I came home and talked to my dad, and I was scared. Now I think of God totally differently. Unfortunately, some Christians still have that same belief set as they did when they first got saved. It hasn't really progressed um, because they, they get locked in to traditions or what have you, and there's no advancing or understanding what's going on um, with God. So I find it to be a blessing. Um, and again, if you've never read those, that series of books, I highly recommend it. Um, they're very easy. They're not deep and theological. Uh, they're great. And they got a lot of good, it's got a lot of good stuff in it, um, as I find most of them do. Um, so what I want to do today um, is introduce these seven ways, again, uh, a reintroduction, again, to myself 
and to, to anyone who's interested of what, how different ways that we can read the Bible, right? We all hopefully open up our Bibles and read them. Uh, I read it and I have this app I use in the mornings to listen to it. Um, but that's to me, I'm sitting and I'm reading something that's available to me and it's got great stuff in it and little tidbits pop out. But this, what I'm going to describe, is the reading where the little thing pops out and you decide to follow it. Or you read something and you decide to take a look at it and you want to have a deeper understanding of what's being said, um, other than just a cursory reading. So the first thing out of the seven is that the Bible is a text in travail. So how this matters and why, to me, why it matters, to me, this is probably one of the biggest ones that I try to remember, because uh, it seems to, in my mind to make a lot of sense as I go through, we'll say, read through the Old Testament and then approach the New Testament and what is actually happening. Um, you know, why does it seem that God is one way somewhere, but a total opposite way somewhere else? Um, because personally, I don't necessarily think that is what God is. I think God is God. And it's the understanding of the people that he's trying to have a relationship with that's changing. Uh, and that's what text in travail is about. So it's where you might have taken texts that seemed contrary to each other. Uh, once I read, um, I read uh, two books by Greg Boyd, which were phenomenal. Uh, a lot more difficult to get through than Mr. Jerzak's, but he has a smaller book that kind of condenses all those things. I can't remember the name of it now. It's much easier to read, but the first chapter, he lists a whole bunch of scriptures, and he reads them out, and then he starts asking questions of the reader. Is this God? Is this the God you believe in? Does this match what God did on the cross? What is going on in these passages? And then he takes you through the book and tries, he doesn't use the word text and travail, but he kind of uses that idea uh, in his book to show some things about those particular passages. And it's very interesting. So what it's doing is it's allowing to see you, see the Bible as something that's going through labor pains something that's trying to show something, but because of the nature in which it's trying to show the whole history, all the different cultures, societies, and minds that are doing it, it's really full of labor and full of pain. I almost think now that it should be that way when we're looking at our Bibles and reading it. It shouldn't just be an open and say, oh, that was easy. It should be something that's causing us to stop and think, what is trying to be said here? What is it that I'm looking at? So it's written by people who were conflicted in their minds about each other and about God. Remember last week we talked about, uh, um, now I can't think of the keys, not Zimri, Omri, King Omri. And all the differences and the things that archaeology has found in this. That's, that's it. Well, they have found this, but it says this here. So how am I gonna, how am I gonna try to work this out and see where we, where we're falling? And what is, what is this passage or this family that lasted, however long they lasted, this dynasty of ancient Israel, how is that gonna show me something about God? because that's why it's in there. So we kind of have to sift through what we're finding and see what it is. Even if things seem to be in conflict, there's a reason for that. And we need to find out what that reason is. Um, I think it's self-defeating just to say, it's the Bible, there's no conflict. That's it. Whatever they found, throw away. This is what it says. I think it's self-defeating because it, it's kind of throwing out something from history and some people that thought something enough about God. Of course, we've learned that Omri did it in the wrong ways, 
But he still thought something about God to make sure that God was first, his first, even if he made him seem to be something he wasn't. That's what's important to find and to look for. So a lot of this conflict that we find, especially in the Old Testament, seems to dissolve away when Jesus is born and comes to the earth, God in the flesh, and starts to display, here I am. This is who I am. Um, there's still some stuff going on that we need to look at, but it, it kind of starts to be erased for us, and the picture becomes clearer. So, uh, it's important that when we re read the Bible or the scriptures, as some of these gentlemen will refer to the Old Testament as the scriptures, and then the whole thing is the Bible. They don't refer to the New Testament as the scriptures. That was Jesus coming on the scene, God coming down on the scene, and setting things right as they would, would be an extreme summary of what they might say. But one thing that I've, I've learned and come to believe myself through many of these by course, reading the Bible and reading what they have read and thinking on it and praying on it is that Christ is the Word. So to me, it doesn't have to be like this for everybody, but to me, the Bible, I, you know, sometimes I still say the Word of God because I've been saying it forever, but it's not the Word of God. It's words used to describe who he is through the people that he had a relationship with. So Jesus, uh, in John chapter 1, is said to be with God, the Word, I'll say, not Jesus, the Word is said to be with God in the very beginning. So this is how I like to picture it. God is a spirit, right? John tells us that. And when I try to remind myself that God is a spirit, God's not flesh and blood being, spirit. It's not a he, not a she, not an it, spirit. And God as spirit, I believe today, even different than I believed a few years ago, is everywhere and in everything. Whole universe. If you want to call it universal, that's what God is. God knew who he was or who God was. And it was amazing. And God wanted to share it. So he bore something out of himself. This is my, how my imagination sees it. He bore something out of himself, and it was really hard. And what came out was what I like to think of as a being. And that being, spiritual being, was all the ideas, everything that God was wrapped up in a form or a substance that can now be used to create and to share who he was. And so that's what happened. Eventually, that being or that substance, which was the word, that was with God in the very beginning, that God created everything through, that's what Paul says, everything that was created was created through him, eventually made its way down into a woman and came out as a human being. Right? That's, the, that's what we know. That's the incarnation. Came out as a human being and then came on earth to show us all the ideas that God was in just three short little years. I mean, the people that were around Jesus were probably getting pictures of who God was as he grew up. But for us, we are given a glimpse into a tiny short time period in all of history of God coming down to dwell with men in a way that they could see and understand and say, all right, here I am. This is who I am. Um, and so it's important, I think, if you're going to follow something like these seven things, to remember that the Christ who becomes uh, the being, the word, the idea of who God is, was here on this earth, and that the Christ is the word of God. 
I was thinking this morning, even if you go by John, that the Word was God. So God is also the Word. So the Word is everywhere. It's life. And it's just permeated everything. Um, and of course, if that was withdrawn, then nothing would be because that's where it all came from. You know, even this morning too, I was thinking about the Big Bang Theory. I thought, there's the Big Bang, right? The Spirit, nothing there but the Spirit. And boom, a big explosion of here is what I'm doing. Um, and it's really cool, really cool to me. The second one is that the Bible is a polyphonic narrative. And what this means is that the Bible is a chorus of many voices. Um, in the book, he says several voices, and he focuses it down to two revelations and one story, but you could do it however you wanted. It's many voices trying to tell a story. Uh, and what, for me, if you think of an opera, I don't like opera, but if I went to an opera and I've seen some stuff, videos of opera, it's all choreographed and it's all goes together. It tells a story. It's nice and neat. But if suddenly another opera came out on stage and another orchestra started playing a different opera and there was two operas going on at once, that would be impossible, right? That's like people, it's football season. And then, of course, I see ads for, oh, watch six different games at once. I'm like, I don't know how I would do that, right? All on the same screen. But, you know, that's the mind of people nowadays with being ingrained in technology. Uh, that's a lot. And it becomes disjointed. And the storylines start to blend together. And they make no sense. But slowly, the opera the stories start to blend together. And as you're watching it, you can start to see how the different pieces are starting to, starting to fit uh, and join together. And as that's happening, the music starts to blend together. When they go off and change sets and stages, when they come back, all of a sudden the stages start to blend together. And all these different things come to the end say this huge diverse cast of two totally different stories somehow in the end blended together to tell one story. That's exactly how the Bible operates. Because every single person in the Bible is saying something a little differently or with a different background or different voice and they all kind of blend together uh, and they become the ultimate story. The third thing is that the story is told through crazy characters and unreliable narrators. That when I first read that, unreliable narrators, that one kind of put me off for a minute. I'm like, all right, so God's using unreliable people to tell his story. God uses anybody to tell his story, whether it's the most reliable person in the world or the most unreliable person in the world. Some of the very characters in the Bible that we uphold is so great. Think of David. Think of the life of David, right? He became, he was a shepherd boy, and all of a sudden he's thrust into the center of everything, and eventually he becomes the king of a huge nation in the earth of the Middle East that's still developing itself into what it eventually became today. And through his life, he does some very unsavory, despicable things. But still, he's telling a story through his life, through the things that he writes in his mind of who God is. It's still in there. So it's almost like you have to kind of take the things he did and read about them, and those things kind of display something, but you almost have to, if that puts you off, you almost have to take that and put it so to the side and then still read. Yeah. Imagine someone that did some of the same things as David's done. 
right? And then some point in their life, they start to realize, and then, oh, wow, God still, God still loved him and did something through him. Mm -hmm. Yep. They wouldn't understand it. So God lets his creation, human beings, and even outside of humanity, tell the story of who he is. It's very important that we see this in God and that we see this in others. So this is a way, it's, a, it's, all what, it's what being cruciform is all about. God took himself and he brought himself down to a level of humanity to say, okay, now you can see something of me in other people. And that's grace. Because you would think, well, God could never do that because they're sinful and this and that. But that's exactly what God did. So the way he worked on the cross, he'd been working that way ever since the beginning. All throughout, the cross was the culmination. So that's a very gracious God, sin-bearing God, even throughout the Old Testament and throughout the Bible, not just on the cross. The fourth thing is the Bible, especially in the New Testament, uses rhetoric in its speeches. Rhetoric was very, very common in the New Testament times, more so than any other time uh, throughout the Bible. Um, there are speakers today that use rhetoric very effectively. But I think it's, we probably use rhetoric throughout our lives and don't even realize it. So we're going to look at that in a second. But it's a, a linguistic form. And so Paul, and now I think even Peter, were masters of using rhetoric in their speech. And I think for Paul, it's a little different than Peter because Paul was brought up in school. Peter came from, where did he come from? A fishing boat. I don't think of people who go, you know, on the most dangerous catch or whatever those shows you watch as being people of rhetoric, right? They seem very earthly, yes, crude, manly, you know, those types of things. But Peter was a great speaker, as you read in Acts. He became a great speaker. Of course, he did that with the help of Jesus, Holy the Spirit. Um, but he was a, a great user of that type of speaking. And Jesus was, of course, um, a master of speaking and getting into people's hearts. So to me, it's become extra important. I even bought a couple books about rhetoric and Paul and rhetoric, and I can't even begin to get through the first couple chapters of either of them because they're way over here. So I, I decided, well, I'm going to shelve those, and someday I'll find rhetoric for dummies or something like that, right? And I'll start at the bottom uh, and get up there. Um, a subgenre to me uh, is diatribe, and diatribe is the form of rhetoric that's probably used most often. So what diatribe is, and this will also kind of help you um, form what rhetoric is, it's an ancient art, and it's using a hypothetical opponent that's really not so hypothetical. So in order for Paul to use a diatribe, he had to know his audience. He had to know them beginning, from the beginning, before he even got there. So now I understand Paul is someone who's saying, oh, I'm going to go to Corinth, but I need to know what's going on in Corinth. Almost like scouts in sports, right? Or a spy. Find out the demographics. I got to know. Who am I going to talk to? What are the things of the day that concern them? What's going on around them? Because when I go talk to them, I'm going to use these things that they might use against what I'm saying, I'm going to use them. And I'm going to bring that out in it so that instantly in their minds, they begin to understand that he's talking about us. Or he's talking about such and such. And this is what they say against him and against Jesus. And that's what 
the diatribe is. It's based on real possible thought patterns of the hearers and then retorting back against what they're saying. So there's been, uh, I, I've read when I was reading about it, there were things about Romans 1 and Romans 7, and other things that we commonly take as this is really what Paul was saying about himself or what he felt, but really what he was doing was using what someone else thought, not what he thought, and trying to turn it around back on them. That's what we do with rhetoric or a diatribe. It's, it takes homework before it happens to make it work. So it wasn't just Paul or Peter or Jesus just off the cuff, saying something. They knew something already about the folks that they were going to talk to. And knowing that, and looking more into what that means, might help us. Because it also exists, uh, rhetoric at least. Um, diatribe was something used more by the Greeks and that, but before that there were still different forms of things close to rhetoric. And if you knew that something was rhetoric or a diatribe, it totally changes the way that you look at it and read it and what you think about what was just being said. The sixth thing, and I have a hard time saying this word for some reason, but it's phenomenology. It's P-H-E-N-O-M-E-N-O-L-O-G-Y, phenomenology. This is that the Bible might describe God's acts and character from a character's point of view. So it's possible that there's per people in the Bible that you've read about, and you've always assumed that what they were saying was true and factual about God. Like God came down and told them to say this about who he was. But it's very possible that what they're saying is just what their thoughts of God was, not actually what God was. Uh, so we can't always assume or just believe that every little thing we read about who God was is true and factual. It might come from the thoughts of a person who was alive at the time. Yes. Yes. I believe so anyways. Not everybody believes that, but I, I think that. Um, they are, in fact, could be characters from a literary story. So it could be someone telling a story, like reading a book about something. Everything in that book is not factual, but everything in that book is trying to get you to think and understand a picture. But if you approach that book in literal terms, you'll never see that picture that they're trying to teach um, because you'll take it in an unintended way. Um, to quote from Mr. Jerzak, he says, Biblical descriptions of God convey a perspective that exists in the eye of the beholder rather than in the nature of what they behold. And, of course, a lot, I think the majority of Christianity would say that's a very, these are very liberal viewpoints, you know, liberal theology of Scripture, which they would be to many people. But it's just a way of thinking and another way to take a look um, at who God is. And Rose just mentioned Job. Um, I, I read a long time ago, and I can't remember who I read it from, that Job, they didn't, this person didn't believe Job was a real person. And so some people might say, then why is he in the Bible? It's, it's a lie or it's not factual. But it's not. It's a story, a really ancient story that someone told, this person believed, way back in like the time of Noah. And they were trying to describe who God was. And it was only the first few chapters. And that philosophers and other thinkers who were really focused on who God was added on to it in the form of a story. Almost like, well, there was this guy. And then he went and talked to Job, and this is what he believed. And then someone else was like, well, there's this other guy. He believes things like this. 
and they added to it. And then by the time you get to the end, someone said, I don't think any of those things are what God is. And God works his way through that story to show who he is, uh, which is really interesting to me anyways. The final one, I think, is one that we've heard probably more times than all the other ones, which is anthropomorphism. That is projecting the emotions or character of God onto a person or animal or whatever you might have it. So you're taking their character and mixing it with the character of God or trying to show who God is through something else. It could be for the right purposes or the wrong purposes. And you think King Omri, that's what he was doing. He was using that. He probably didn't know that term, but he was using that to take what people thought of their gods and project them through writing and iconography and other things to say, this is who God is. And he was using it for his own political gains. Um, so they take things and they work them onto God. It happens, God uses it in the Bible to describe things. Think of God, you know, like, like an eagle with eagle's wings, scooping you up and protecting you. Think of uh, the literal meanings of, of Genesis 1-1, of God fluttering over the surface of the deep. There's a chaotic something going on. And like an eagle, he's coming down and he's fluttering over it because mixed in that chaos is what he really wants to make and rescue from it. And so it's like an eagle protecting its young. He's coming down and fluttering. And uh, that's the Jewish idea of what that verse means um, in the beginning. And so literalism, literalism in this regard can be devastating to someone's view of God. I've read many times where people will say, that's just anthropomorphism, you can't use that, or that you're just projecting that onto God based on this or that. But that's what God could be doing. So some of the things we read in Scripture are like that. It'll say, God is like this. He'll even say, I'm like this, right? He's a father, he's a king, but then he's a woman, right? birthing things, birthing something, creating something, taking care of you like a mother. So God projects himself while taking on qualities of things that we see and perceive every day to give us an idea of who he is. So these seven things, to me, as I said in the beginning, uh, I, I don't use them all, all the time. And I originally intended to make a note or something, and when I'm reading and studying, take out this card and say, is this going on, is this going on, is this going on, is this going on? I think that's the intent of Mr. Jerzak. But being a normal person, you know, I finished the book, I closed it up, I did this original series, got done with it, and a couple of the things have stuck with me, but not everything. And so, hopefully, now I'm doing this another time. Some of this stuff, as I do it with you, I'll be able to say, okay, I'm going to add on another one now in, in what I'm reading. And hopefully that will help us uh, read and understand the Bible and what we're reading and get what God is hoping that we'll get out of it. And I think for each of us, that could be different. You know, depending on what's going on in your life or things that are around you things that are affecting the way you're thinking. God's going to use that. He's going to plant little things and say, okay, now the next time they read or think about me, I'm going to try to use that and maybe get them to see something different about me. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned from uh, reading Richard Rohr that I was very, I found it very objectionable was seeing Christ in every single person. Because in my mind, I think, how can I see Christ in every single person? 
When I'm honest, I can't even see Christ in me half the time. But life, remember, Christ is the Word. The Word is life. The Word is what God brought out in the beginning to share, to create. It's life. There's something of God everywhere. Everywhere. If we think that way and try to perceive things in that way, it will help us as we learn. It will help us as we read. It will help us grow in our relationship and our character with God, which is ultimately what his goal is. And you might say, well, I'm never going to have that. I'm going to die, and I'm never going to have it all. Well, you're on the way, and this life is about experience, experience, experience. As long as you keep that, God and Christ, in front of you and go through life that way, it's going to show you things. And that is what uh, the main goal is of the Bible. Amen.